Good evening, and welcome to Hurricane Baptist Church Wednesday night Bible study. If uh, this gets posted on time, everything goes right. Uh, we should be the night before Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Eve, and I just want to wish you all a, a happy Thanksgiving, a blessed Thanksgiving, and pray that we're truly thankful for all that God's provided for us. And we're into the study of Acts, and this is uh, lesson number seven, and we'll be looking at chapters uh, to chapter two, verses uh, 25 to 36. We know that uh, we've already seen where Jesus uh, was out. He gave the Great Commission to the disciples uh, to go into all the world and, and share the gospel. And we saw then Pentecost, they went and they waited in Jerusalem and Pentecost came and we talked about the, the, t the tongues of fire or looked like tongues of fire on each uh, a person there. And then we got on down and we see about the events that's coming. And then we seen that good news that said uh, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we got through all of that, and we're down here to verse uh, 25. We'll pick up this evening, and he says, uh, "For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for He is on my right hand that I should not be moved." And so David is talking about. Uh, a prophecy, there's, uh, David's being a, a prophet here, and if we wanted to go look where that's at over in the Old Testament, we'd go to Psalms uh, chapter 16 and verses 8 to 11, and it says here, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. Uh, my flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That will show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So we see this prophecy, and then it's repeated here by David uh, in this portion of Scripture we're looking at today. So understand now, David is talking about Jesus. He's not talking about himself. He Notice he said, for David speaketh concerning him. And then he goes ahead and talks about uh, what Christ says here. He like, I saw, foresaw the Lord always at my, before my face. And so the idea is he, he kept his... As Christ walked this earth, you know, we, we know that he said that he came to fulfill or do the will of him that sent him. So he came to do the will of God the Father. He's been, that's where his focus was. So he was, he kept, he constantly kept his mind and his eyes focused on, on, on the Father, on his call, what he was called to do. Uh, I like that over in um, like 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, A casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and this, listen, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So he, he said uh, he kept God before him all the time. And, and as I was just uh, studying over this, uh, it come to mind, imagine what it would be like if we could live, just live a day like that. Now, Jesus is totally focused on his Father. He's focused on his call. He's focused on his work. He's focused on what he needs to do. And so if we could just keep God's face before us all the time, that we would think the right things according to the will of God, that we would say the right things according to the will of God, and that we would do the right things according to the will of God. If we could just stay focused on that, and I don't mean you're just sitting in the back in a chair and you're looking and you're not going through the day and saying, what would Jesus do or what would you know, that you're so full of the, uh, the Holy Spirit, you're so controlled by the Spirit, that as you make your decisions through the day, uh, you get ready to say something, you say the right thing. Uh, you get, you have a situation, you, you think the right thing, or you react in the right way. And uh, I, I know that uh, when, I, when I say that, uh, I understand, you know, that's, that's the way out there. It's something that we'd love to be able to, I'd love to be able to do that. And think of the joy and the peace you would have if you could do that. But I have this problem, I don't know about you, but I have to deal with the flesh too. And you know, my, my mind wanders sometimes, even in my prayer time, you'd be, I'd be praying and something will pop into my mind, I wonder, where did that come from? So we, we have this fight with the world and the flesh and the devil, and we have life that we're living on this earth in the flesh. So it's, it's hard to stay focused on our, our call as a Christian. You know, everything that we say, think, and do should be funneled into that life of a Christian. And so those are difficult things to do, and we're going to understand that we need to do that in this life as we understand who, who God is and how He works in our life. And He says here, I, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for He is on my right hand. And that's the right hand is the hand of power. That's a position of power. Uh, that's where our protector would be. And He says here that, uh, that He's on His right hand, that I should not be moved. That I won't be, I won't be moved away from my path. I won't be moved away from where I'm supposed to be going. And we know that to, as he, Christ lived those uh, three years, three and a half years on earth as a, not 
I'm talking about as, I'm, as an adult now, as he's doing his ministry, the three, three and a half years that he walked, he had, he had a lot of, of pressure from each side, pushing him back and forth, trying to get him off of the path. And we're going to look at some of those things. But the idea here, he says that, that God is on my right hand. And therefore, I'm not going to be moved. The Father is walking right along beside me. He's, he's the power. He's the one that's, that's holding me where I need to be. Isaiah 41, 13 says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not. Notice those words. Fear not, I will help thee. You know, as we go through this life and the, the challenges that Jesus faced, the, the oppression he faced, and some, we don't face anything like he did. Most of us don't. A few nasty words now and there. Somebody might rebuke us a little bit, but we don't face all the confrontation. We don't face the idea that some of our own people are trying to kill us. And so, but he could stay firm because his father was in control. His father was walking by him in, in, with his right hand. We have, he was indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. And we see that a little bit later. But we see this walk, and that's what David's talking about here. He said, I, I saw this coming. I saw the Christ coming, and I see what happened. He kept his face focused. He kept his face focused on the, the call, on the, the work that the Father sent him to do. You know, and I don't know about you, but I'm thankful he did that. Because the, he went all the way he, from the birth to the cross. All the way through his life, he lived that sinless life. He was that, that perfect example. He was able to do that. He was indwelled by the Spirit when you see that. We know that we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit when we get saved. So we have that power within us too. So he says here, he, he's on my right hand, this position of power, a place for the protector. He says, I will not be moved. I'm, I'm, I'm stable. I'm set. And, uh, you know, I, I, just a little side note, if you would. Um, here not too long ago, I was uh, called to look at a paper about a, of a doctrinal statement, basically, of where these, uh, these people stood. And uh, I was looking at it, and, and what, some of it sounded so good. It sounded so good, and, and uh, it made you, kind of made you wonder a little bit. Well, you know, I believe this, and they're saying this, and they have this evidence. But when I got looking at it and thinking about it, I started taking the Scripture, and we're going back to the scripture that I'm familiar with from studying the scripture and memorizing the scripture. And I noticed as they were, I, as this was all on a screen, and I was looking at it, and I noticed that when they did some of the verse references, they would do uh, like a, one phrase, and they'd put a little dot, 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 and then continue the verse. And I got noticing that what they were doing is they were leaving out the part that might show that they were not right. So whenever you see that, and we've all done it, everybody that's made any notes or anything, you'll, you just take parts of it because you use like part A of a scripture and just leave dot, dot, dot and come back to it. But whenever you see that, if you have any questions, go to the Word of God. See what the space was that's missing because then, then you won't be moved. You, I'm of the opinion that you have to know what you believe and why you believe it. And then you can stand for Him. And that's what, as we have the, the Spirit of God within us, we have the Word of God See, then we can stand firm too. God is with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we'll go ahead down to verse 26. He says, Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad, and moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Now, we're still talking about Christ. And the idea was the heart to rejoice, to be joyful, full of euphoria, full of God's presence and glory. A heart that's rejoicing. You know what helps to bring that rejoicing heart is we know about Jesus because Jesus is walking with his Father. And see, he wasn't, he wasn't getting off the path. He was in sweet fellowship with his father all the time. And, you know, as we walk as Christians through this life, you know, when, when we're in tune with God, when we're there where we need to be, you know, and we're not perfect, I understand that. And, you, and I know I'm not, you're not, but, but more, as close as we can, we feel good about our walk with the Lord. We have that joy, then, don't we? have that, that uh, euphoria, that it's, things can feel good. And so that's what he's talking about. So Jesus, he could say that because that's where he was at and that's where we would like to be. He says, then, he says, the tongue is to be glad. What's he mean there? He says that my tongue was glad. It, it leapt for joy. It broke. It, he said things. He says, the idea is that he broke forth with praise and psalm. You know, people giving testimony, praising God. Look what God has done for me. And that's what Jesus did, praising what, what his father had done for him, what his father was doing for him. And we understand then this, that when you're in the right fellowship with God and you have that attitude that God would have us to have, then we can sing. Oh, can't we sing? You know, sound so good and praise. You know, it's not, I don't mean it's sounding good in, uh, as far as the tune, but the, the heart's there. You know, you, you hear somebody sing a song and they might have a beautiful voice, but you hear somebody really, really sing the song where it's coming from the heart, like some of our old hymns. 
You, you can just feel that that presence of their of the Holy Spirit of God in their life and how He's controlling their life. And that's what it was with Christ. He was breaking forth. His tongue was so glad, and and my flesh shall rest in hope. That means the rest means to be shall tabernacle or pitch a tent. As we go ahead and we look at that there, he says here, uh, moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope that uh, he's going to pitch a tent, his tabernacle, what he's living in there. And he said, it rests in hope. Uh, that that hope, that's not, you know, it's not, boy, I sure hope this comes out right. I, I sure, I, I wish this would happen. No, it's, it's a, a confidence. A hope has the idea of expectation of confidence. He said, I, I know. See, I, I know I can, I know where I'm at, I know who I am, and my flesh shall rest in that confidence. Because I know what's going to happen. My Father has told me what's going to happen, and I know it will happen according to what He's planned out for me. That's what basically as Peter's preaching this sermon. This is part of his sermon to the people after the day of, or at the Pentecost here, and he's saying, this is, this is what David talked about. He's what, here's what he talked about, the Messiah. That's who he's talking about here. He's talking about the Messiah. And then he goes ahead, he says, because, verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Uh, the word leave there has the idea of forsaken, abandoned, or to doom permanently in hell. It's like, yeah, you're in hell, the realm of the dead. Hell here is referred to as the realm of the dead. And he said, uh, you're not going to abandon me there. You're not going to leave me there. And that was, that's what the idea has there that... Uh, to leave, or I will not forsake you. I, we think over in uh, Hebrews 13:5. He says, I, "I will never leave you nor forsake you." That's the, I'll never abandon you. I'll never turn my back on you. And that's a, a great, great verse, a great promise for you and I. And we, Jesus is talking about that here. He says, "I, I know." that you're not going to leave me in the realm of the dead. I'm not going to suffer there. I'm not going to be there. The Holy One, that's, that's Jesus, sinless, righteous, pure. And the Holy One, he referred to himself as that a lot. The Holy One. And then we go a little bit further there. He says that the word about corruption. Corruption or decay. He said, he, he's not going to be in that grave long enough to decay. And he wasn't, was he? Uh, we, he went in on, we believe on a Friday, Good Friday, he was crucified in the grave. Third, three days later, he was out. Wasn't there long enough to suffer corruption? Uh, we know that uh, when we look at Lazarus, remember what when Jesus came in and brought Lazarus out of the tomb, resurrected him, and, and uh, they said, "Oh, he's been there four days." So he thinks, in other words, he was already facing the, the corruption of the body, the decay of the body. And Jesus wasn't there. He didn't see that corruption. He didn't face that corruption. So we go ahead a little bit further now. He said, "Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy." with thy countenance. So we hear the, the ways of life, the, the path of life. So that you, you've made known to me how I need to walk in this life. And that, that makes me full of joy with my countenance. He said, I, I, just, I just, I look at, I feel it. He said, you've shown me the path I need to walk. And when we know that we're walking the path that God would have us to walk, and again, remember, Peter's preaching this sermon. So these people here, uh, they're just listening to this sermon. And we see what happens here in a few verses. But, but the idea is that, that they need, we need to know the path that God wants us to walk, don't we? And that Jesus knew it. And we know it too in a way. We don't have the specific orders like he did. We don't have that specific goal like he had. But we know what our call is, don't we? We know our call is to be a witness, to be a testimony to Christ. And we also know that we should live the kind of life, walk that path, he laid that path out for us. Like he says, the ways of life are the path of life. We know that that path is laid before us. We don't know how many stumbling blocks are going to be there, or how many pitfalls are going to be there, but we know that the path is to bring glory to God. And that's our call. That's our purpose. And so when we walk that path and when we're living it like we should, then we can do that with great joy. Again, it goes back to the idea when I'm walking with the Lord, when I'm, when I'm in fellowship with Him, when I'm praying and I'm reading the scripture and I'm really meditating, I'm really getting into that desire, listen, to have the desire to walk with God. Not, and I don't mean just to, to walk along, but I mean to walk in fellowship with Him. See, when I'm walking in fellowship with Him, I'm doing right. I'm living like I should. I'm a blessing to Him and I'm a blessing to those around me. I like to think of that a lot of times when, I, when we do things. I like to be a blessing to the people that we minister to. Be a blessing to the Lord as we minister. And uh, 
You see, this is what he's talking about. This is the life of Christ, 25 to 28 there, those verses. He talks about the, the prophecy about what Jesus' life was going to be like here on earth as far as his walk with the Lord, his commitment to the Father. So we go a little bit further, and we see that um, in verse 29, Men and brethren, so here's Peter talking now, and he's back, he said, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. I want to tell you about David now. We talked about Jesus. Let's talk about David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us today, unto this day. He says, there's, figuratively speaking, there's his grave. We see it over there. We know it wasn't right there, but he said, it's there. It's with us today. We know that he's dead and buried. He didn't get, come up out of the grave. He is still in the grave. That body is still down there. Therefore, being a prophet, and he was a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He was a prophet, and God had revealed, revealed to him that Messiah, that Messiah, Christ the Messiah, would come through his line. Over in Psalm 89, we see that. He says in verses uh, uh, 3 and 4, he said, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build upon thy throne to all generations. Selah. And in the same chapter, same Psalm, verses 35 to 37, once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven, Selah. So we see God's promise to David that through his line, through his lineage, through him, that the Messiah would be born. And so we understand then that that had his body, we'll go ahead a little bit further there, he says that uh, in verse um, 31, he's seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, when he talked back up in verse 27 that the soul wouldn't stay in hell nor the Holy One to see corruption. That's what he's talking about. There's going to be a resurrection. That's the only way that could happen. There had to be a resurrection. Without the resurrection, the body would have stayed in the realm of the dead and the body would have corrupted, would have decayed. So he's referring back and he's saying that that's who he is. His, his flesh, he's not going to face that. And so he wouldn't see corruption. The resurrection. Well, when we study the resurrection, we could get into that in depth. But the, the resurrection is the key. That is the key. Without that bodily, bodily resurrection, we have no hope. And we can read, you can read that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 sometime. Let's go a little bit further though, so we can get through here today. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are witnesses. He said we, there was a bodily resurrection, and we've seen it. It's apostle. We've all seen that body. We've witnessed that. We've touched him. We've walked with him. We've ate with him. We've done all those things. He said, we have done that. That resurrection was a real event. It's not just a spiritual thing. No, it was a physical thing that they got to witness. Go a little bit further there, and he says, uh, therefore, verse 33, being by the right hand of God exalted. So he was exalted up to that right hand. We know that he ascended back to heaven, and he's at the right hand of the Father. Having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, we know that he was promised he'd have the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost was with him. Over in uh, Matthew chapter 3, and verse 16, when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove down upon him. And in chapter 4, verse number 1 in Matthew there, he was led by the Spirit up into the wilderness. So we see the, the, uh, the uh, influence or the control of the Spirit in his life, and we have the same thing. You know, when we look at how Jesus walked on this earth, we see how he did things. We are indwelled by the same, we have the same power within us that he had. So when we say, oh, I can't witness like that, I can't tell other people, look what Jesus did, look what Peter's doing here. It's Peter, the one that denied him three times at his trial. All of a sudden, he's up in front of these multitudes saying, listen to me, I'm going to tell you something here. He's going to tell them something really important here in a moment. It could, could really shake him up. He said, uh, uh, they're going a little bit further now, he said that um, being at the right hand exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear for David... When he's over in the grave, is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. So we see the, the exaltation of Christ. He said, Here you're with me. I'm going to bring all your foes, all your enemies to, to your footstool. Therefore, verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly, 
that, that word assuredly means uh, with full confidence. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's, it's a given. There's no way to change it. It's what it is. And he said, let Israel know assuredly that God, the Father, hath made the same Jesus whom you crucified. Hey, remember, man? Remember remember that trial? Remember taking him up that a trail? Remember when they nailed him to the cross? You, not the Romans, you crucified him. You're the ones that were responsible. He said, hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified. And here's what God did for him. He made him Lord and he made him Christ. He declared him to be the Lord. He's the master. He's the Messiah. God the Father sent his son down here to be the master and be the Messiah. This is the one. Your, your Messiah, your deliverer, that's the one you killed. You crucified him. We're going to stop there and we'll pick up again uh, next week. But this, as you read that, and especially those verses up there, 25 to 20, just, if you can just kind of get the feel that if you could just walk that way, if you could just walk through this life, you know, no matter what your age are, is, you know, whether you're a teenager or you're an old man like me, you know, the idea is that, that you could just stay focused on what God wants you to do, that you could please Him just by being obedient. That's, that's what He wants. He, he wants obedience. And then those other things that you can do for him are great. But step one, obey. Okay? So if you're watching this and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, well then he's not your master. He's not your Messiah. He's not your Savior. But you can make him that. All you have to do is understand that you're a sinner. You're walking with the world. Repent. Turn from the world and turn to God and put your faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as a payment for your sin. Believing in your heart that Jesus paid the price, him and him alone, there's nothing to be added to it. His shed blood paid the price for your sins. Would you put your faith and trust in him, you'll have eternal life. We'll talk more about that next week. We're going to get into verse number 38. There's some, maybe some questions you might have about that, some controversy. So for us that are Christians, focus. I challenge you to look at tomorrow and the next day and see if you're living your life the best you can. Not, not sinlessness, but the best you can. Focus. Know the Word of God. Know what God wants. And respect that and honor that. And God can bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day and this time that we can come before you, Lord. And we just pray that we would be a blessing to you, that we would walk this pathway of life, that people would see Christ in us, see that love and see that passion that we have for you, Lord, and that we would stay focused on the things that we think and the things we say and the things we do, that they would bring honor to you and that people would have a desire to know Jesus as their own Savior. We thank you for this time that we can be together, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.